and it's my great pleasure to introduce this series, which we have designed to celebrate um, by having distinguished speakers different aspects of Birkbeck. So Birkbeck is 200 years old on December 3rd, um, 2023. Um, and as some of you will have heard me say before, perhaps I think it happens, that not many institutions reach 200 years, but still fewer reach it doing something that their founder would recognize. So our founder, after whom we named George Birkbeck, was about an advocate of education for working people. And that is something which we continue to do 200 years later across a wide range of subjects. We had a fascinating lecture by Sir Paul Marshall as the first of these, a businessman who has founded various academy um, trusts. Today, we are moving um, on to look at the arts, and we're very privileged um, to have with us Rene Kwa Aruma, the um, artistic director of the Young Vic, but not just the artistic director, also a actor, playwright, who has been produced at the National Theatre, and I don't know if you regard this as your greatest distinction, mm -hmm. Chancellor of the University of the Arts, so a university connection there, and he's going to speak to us today about the dramaturgy of leadership. So welcome, and over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for inviting me. Um, please excuse my cane. Uh, on Saturday night, we had a, a show at the Young Vic, um, a 24 hour endurance piece called The Second Woman. And that was uh, Ruth Wilson, who was on stage for 24 hours, um, kind of uh, chucking 100 men. Um, and uh, it was the most amazing, a night of theatre I think I've, I've ever seen. A hundred male participants, some famous, some um, from our community, just um, going on stage and acting with her for eight minutes and her saying, I think we're over. But sometimes seven if she didn't like them, sometimes nine <laughs> if she really did. And, um, and, and like a silly guy, I was running around. We had lines around the block. And so uh, my ego said, I've got to get this and put it on Facebook or something. And I, and I was running around the block, filming the audience, saying hi. And then I slipped off the curb and sprained my ankle. So uh, thank you. I wanted that. Um, <laughs> that's exactly what, what I wanted you to do. Uh, I, and so uh, excuse me if I'm lean at, at any one point in time. As I said, thank you so much. I'm really, um, I was really honored to be asked. And even though um, I'm in day two of rehearsal for my new play, and, and in the morning I'm editing um, my, the first film that, I, that I've made, I, I wanted to do this um, because, as you said, there are a few institutions that are still doing the thing that their founders wanted them to do. And Birkbeck holds a special place in my heart because um, one of the, one of the people who walked me into manhood, Marcus Garvey, studied here. Um, and, and I remember it was the first time I'd, I, I think I'd heard about Birkbeck when I was reading the opinions and philosophies of. And he said, and I was like, wow, what is this place? And I looked it up and, and, and I, I went, you know, I think maybe I'll come here as well because I was a working actor. It just so happened that um, I went to the University of the Arts instead, but I really looked up coming here. I didn't want to say that for real and for true. It's, not. Um, it, it's slightly intimidating um, being number two because I heard that number one was really good. Um, and, and also when I looked there and I said, the dramaturgy of leadership, and I went, why did I say that? But I'm a little bit, as you might tell, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm an African guy, and uh, I believe in circular storytelling. I believe in give and take and call and response. So uh, I won't just be talking to you. Uh, you will be speaking back to me, is my hope. Um, and let me start like this. Um, I want you to take 25 seconds and I want you to think of, I don't know, a lyric, a line from a poem. 
something from your favorite song or sonnet. And I want you to think about the one that came into your life just when you really needed it. When you were low, or when you needed inspiration, or you needed support. What is that song, that poem, that you, that you can re recall right now? And I'm going to give you 20 seconds to think about it, starting now. Could be a line from a play or a movie. Could be the song you just go back to over and over again. And um, when you've got there, just indicate by raising your hand. That's about a third of you. <laughs> I'm going to give you another 10 seconds for the ones that I haven't seen the hands yet. I think we're getting close. Good. And now, on the count of three, I'll go one, two, three, and I'll indicate. <laughs> I use this for something other than my balancing my ego. Um, and you will scream it at the top of your lungs, <laughs> into the air. You good? It means if you made it up and you were just going, yeah, I'm just going to put my hand up. The person sat, <laughs> the person sat next to you where you go, what? All right, here we go. One, two, three. My Keep it going. We there, we got there. That was pretty wonderful. I, I heard real words and not just <laughs> Mine was Fight the Power. And it was from a, a band called Public Enemy. And that song was released in 1989. I have two. My second one was from a band called uh, Sounds of Blackness and there was a song called Optimistic I can hear some people go oh, was, that, was that yours too? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Promise you I'm not a mind reader like <laughs> scanning um, and, and that song You Can Win as long as you keep your head to the sky and I, I was doing a play when that song came out and I really hated the play and I hated the part that I was doing in it. And I, I was behaving really badly. As in, I was letting the audience know while I was on stage that I hated doing it. And I came into work one day and the producer kind of chastised me. And my ego got really pricked. And at the time I had just got a mortgage for my first home and I needed that money. And the way he spoke to me, I felt like I was a child. And I was just about to use some words that I won't use right now, but I think you know what I was. And those words flashed. You can win so long as you keep your head to the sky. And I didn't resign. And I was able to furnish the downstairs of my house <laughs> by the time I got to the end of that contract. The reason I, I ask us to do that is because sometimes art can, can be perceived as sitting within the narrow bandwidth of entertainment. But it is so much more than that. It is the thing we rely upon to define ourselves by. It is the crutch we lean on when we want to change our vibrational level. 
It is the reflection point during COVID when you didn't know that you would see anybody else. And so you went to Netflix and that you just watched over and over and over again and heard your phone ring over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> that, that art, for me, is how civilizations are not just defined, not just remembered, but how they are judged. If I say Egypt, the first image that flashes to your mind is something architectural. If I say Greece, the first thing is the words, the letters. Is I, I guarantee nearly every culture that we love and adore, there is something of their art that springs to our mind relatively quickly. And so for me, to have dedicated my life to art, to the pursuit of art, to the pursuit of excellence in art, doesn't mean that I've got there all of the time, but the pursuit of it means that I feel very blessed. A director friend of mine once said to me, he said, the artist is God's Christmas present to herself. And I... I really relate to it. I often say when an actor friend comes up to me and says, yeah, I don't act anymore, or I don't sing anymore, or I don't do that, I feel as if the all, as if the creator sheds a tear because we are given blessings through our art, blessings by which to speak to others, blessings by which to reflect the good, the bad, the ugly. The profound. So when I thought about the dramaturgy of leadership, I, um, I started to begin with why or thinking about how do I lead? So just, just for, I mean, you probably know this anyway, but I, I was very fortunate in my career that, um, that I, I started off as a singer a singer-songwriter. And actually, Denise, they're a friend of mine from back in the day. Used to sing on some of my records. Yo! We haven't seen each other for 25 years and we're like here today. I'm like overjoyed. You know I had to shout you out, right? <laughs> um, and I got to about 25 and it just wasn't happening. And I went, yo, um, this is, this is going gonna, gonna to take me out. And so I gave up. And at the time, I had a recording studio in my house. Today's terms would have been worth about, I don't know, 80 grand. And I was so low that I called all of my friends and I said, yo, I'm done. Um, just come and get it. No one has to pay me for anything. Just come and just pick it up. And people came and they collected samplers. I had a big keyboard at the time. It was called the M1. It was the biggest one, the, the big guy. And someone came and they picked it up and, and I just cleared out. Funny story about that, however, which I'll get to. I'll tell you the M1 story, remember that. Um, and so then I w wandered in the, in the artistic wilderness because I knew that I wanted to contribute. I knew that I wanted to be able to say something. I knew I wanted to give my art a meaning because my mother wanted me to be a lawyer. She wanted me to be, a, you know, a social justice lawyer. We didn't use those terms in those days, of course. But coming from the black community who had faced all of the oppression that we had faced, faced that, that she wanted me to be able to use something to help, to give back. And I knew that I wanted to do that with my art. You know, I was, I was quite fortunate that uh, one day as an actor, a group of us were sat around and we were complaining about it, going, oh my God, there are no jobs, there are no jobs. And I went, okay, I'm going to start writing. Not writing for myself, but writing so that I could do the thing, be the thing that we were talking about. And so I started to write and that was really great. And then plays came on and, and, and plays were produced and that was really good. Then I got bored of just being a playwright. And I went, because I, at that time, I had to wait for white directors to come and direct my work because it wasn't perceived that there were black playwright, bl sorry, black directors who could direct at the highest theaters. Um, and so I had to wait for them. And then I got really bored of that. I was just like, I'm not gonna wait. For, the, for that, and so then I learned to direct. I was really fortunate that, that, that I could do that. And then I, I started directing for a while, and then I got really bored of just waiting for artistic directors to 
give me a gig and or to or even to program the kind of work that I wanted to see because I just kept complaining about it. And my mother would always say, stop complaining or don't complain until you walk in someone's moccasins. And so I woke up one morning, and this was 2010 or 11, and I went, okay, I want to be an artistic director. I want to be a gatekeeper. And it just so happened that out of the blue, I got a call from the president of Senegal. <laughs> As you do. Well, actually, it was his daughter. It wasn't really him, but alas. Uh, it sounds better if I go that way. Um, and said, would you like to be the artistic director of the historic World Festival of Black Arts and Culture in Senegal. And by the way, while you're there, um, would you like to direct the opening ceremony? You'll have a cast of about 500 and it'll be in the, in the stadium. And we'll have 16 disciplines in all 53 countries of Africa and, and those throughout the diaspora will be, will, will, you know, will be present. But hitherto, the largest cast I've directed is about four people on the stage of the tricycle. <laughs> I went, yeah, <laughs> I can do it. Yeah, of course I can. Um, and I, I flew out to Senegal. And it was one of the greatest moments of my life. While I was in Senegal, I was asked to go and do a workshop somewhere in a village deep away from Dakar. And I pulled up and uh, I walked into the room and I saw an M1. So I went, yo, uh, yeah, I used to have an M1 back in the day, I knew it. And I went up to it, and, the, and the, I think the A key was slightly raised. And I was like, oh, my A key was slightly raised. <laughs> and then I looked underneath, and it was KKA. My keyboard from 20 years before had found its way to meet me in Senegal. I was meant to give that away, to meet it, to say, hey, remember me? Um, I then went on to, after that, and I'll stop doing biography in a moment. It's really boring. Um, but I, I then went on to, to the United States to, to run Baltimore Center Stage and to run a regional theater. And it was one of the leading regional theaters in the, in the country at the time. And it was slightly on the, on the decline. And, and I had not run a regional theater, and I certainly hadn't run a regional theater in the United States. And, uh, and I was fortunate they gave me the job, and that's where the dramaturgy of leadership came in. Because for me, I didn't know how to lead. I knew how to contribute. I knew how to shape my art so that it could be a catalyst for a debate. But did I know how to lead? And so what I did was, I went back to my baseline skill. That was being a playwright. And I started to think, what is act one of leadership? What is the opening that you can do that will pull an audience in and make them lean into, your, into the thing that you want them to engage with? And it seemed really odd, because at the time I was the only playwright in, in America that was, that was an artistic director. And I would say to myself, I'd say, what, what is your process? You're, I mean, obviously you've not done the MBA, what is your process? And I'd say playwriting. And I went, yeah, of course. But had, I went, so my act one is going to be this. And, and I, I'm, I'm fond of telling this story. Is that I went, okay, I've got to grab their attention. And so I, uh, I programmed really discursive, powerful, what I perceive to be really powerful work. And, um, but I actually went to become, I became an artistic director mainly because of one play. I went to see a play at the Royal Court and it was called Clybourne Park. And, um, and Clybourne Park was the hit play of the world. It won the Pulitzer, had won everything in wars, just, I mean, I don't know how much money you made off it. It won everything. And I hated it. <laughs> and I hated the play because I felt that what it had done was, it was its assertion, and for those who don't know the plot, basically it was a riff on um, uh, Lorraine Hansberry's Raisin in the Sun. And in Lorraine Hansberry's Raisin in the Sun, 
Basically, it was about um, the younger family and the elder son who got who was like, Mama, I need the money from our dead father's insurance so that I can be somebody. And and then they move into this white neighborhood. And, and that's the, the end of that. And so he picked up the play with the white family that sold them the house in the in the white neighborhood. For, or, so they would be the first black family into that neighborhood. And so the first act of this play was for me saying, and the, the dialogue would say, if you let those blacks in, they'll destroy the neighborhood. Don't do it. And he does. And in the second act, we jump forward 50, 60 years, and it's a ghetto, and it's ruined, and it's crazy, drugged up, and but it is ripe to be gentrified. And a young white couple come in and go, hey, we're going to gentrify the area. And if everyone's going, oh, no, you shouldn't do that, but, you know, no gentrification. But its underlying theme for me was that white people build and black people destroy. And off the back of one of the classics, the black classics of the 20th century, Lorraine Hansberry, I was mortified. I was angry. I was, and I was determined that I will become an artistic director. So plays like that never make it to the stage because it is a lack of black um, gatekeepers. And I got to Baltimore and I went, you know what would be really great? <laughs> Clyde Wong Park. <laughs> And I was like, no, 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 of course not. No, 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 no. And I went, oh. And so I did my first year and we did the budget and the budget just wouldn't balance and it kept, it kept trying and I wouldn't balance. And the only play <laughs> that, would make, that would make it balance was Clyburn Park. And so I, if my foot wasn't damaged, I would stroll up and down in the way that I did and I walked up and then I went, okay, okay. What are you going to do? I went, okay, I'm going to put on Clyburn Park but I'm also going to write a play and I'm going to put the play in rep with that play. So it'll be one night Clybourne Park, one night my play. And my play will challenge the tenets of, of what I perceive to be supremacist writing. Well, and I go back to the dramaturgy of leadership. All of a sudden, Front page New York Times, or New York Times Arts, Washington Post, a new sheriff has come into town. It was like, I, I mean, I literally, I was getting petrified. It was like, like we went from that kind of PR to huge, there was a documentary by PPS, PBS made about us. It went boom. And by the time I got to the end of that season, even though we'd got publicity and, 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 and our status had risen, I had lost 900 of my 12,000 subscribers. And why did I lose them? Well, I lost them because I landed with an arrogance that what story I want to tell is the story that the audience want to hear. I didn't listen. I didn't do the, I didn't do enough research to say, I need to meet you where you are and incrementally bring you to the place that I want. I just landed and went boom. The first play that I put on was an adaptation of Arthur Miller's Enemy of the People of, of the Ibsen. And if anybody doesn't know that story, I'm sure that people do, but basically it's, it's uh, two brothers. One's a mayor, one's a doctor of a town, and, uh, and it's a spa town, and everybody goes there. It's riches is made off of people getting well off the water. And the doctor wakes up one day and he says, the water is not healing people, the water is killing people. And he says to his brother, so we're gonna have to shut it down. And his brother says, shut it down, and what are we gonna do? What's the town gonna do? And off the play goes, and by the time we get to the end of the play, the doctor has been run out of town. So I, I did this play. And I was just like, oh, it's going to be really clever. The election's coming. It's great. It's great. It's great. My first one out the gate, I really needed it to come in strong. And it flopped. Not only did it flop, flop really, really badly. And so much so that the local newspapers were saying, oh, I think Kwame Kramer is going to ruin our state theater in Maryland. Oh, my God. Is it safe in his hands? I tell you that story to say that on my seven years later, 
when I was leaving. And my board chairman sent me a copy of the Baltimore Sun. And he said, Kwame, please read this article. And in this article, it was about uh, this young man who had single-handedly shut down a corporation who was planning to bring a waste disposal factory into the black area of Baltimore that had a track record of profound health problems for the communities that these things are in. And he went to the mayor and he went to the governor and he galvanized the community and they, after three or four years, well actually it was more like six years, they got the governor to sign that they would not have this pollutant in this black community. And they said to him, the journalist said, so what made you, what made you think at 16 that you could do this? He said, uh, my school took me to see an enemy of the people at Baltimore Center Stage. And I went, if the doctor could do it, so could I. It was at that moment that I understood that art is not about the commerce, the commerce helps. That art is not about the reviews, the reviews help. But art is fundamentally there to inspire even one person to do their best, to fulfill their potential. I am so proud of that young man. I'm so proud that we flopped that show. <laughs> I, again, I, I'm going to refer to why I'm speaking about this in this term, in these terms. Because ultimately we think that there is a separation between the artist and leadership. And that is either leadership of institutions or leadership positions in society. But I think that we have come to the place now where we understand that post-COVID, we are in need as a, as a community, as a nation, and in the West, that we are in need of healing. We lived through two or three years of having to adapt from being an individual to being told that you can't go and see your mother or father if they were, if they were dying. We were told to be afraid, or not even told, not in a conspiracy way, but we naturally developed, developed fear of the breath of people standing next to us. We are in profound need of healing and where best to find that healing for me, it is in the art. It is in a responsible media. It is in seeing reflections of ourselves that allow ourselves to understand how delicate we are at this moment, how fragile we are, how in need of companionship and guidance. I go back to the show on Saturday night, Ruth Wilson on stage by herself, 24 hours. And by the time she got to hour six, the audience filled round the block were intoxicated. By the time it got to hour 12, the audience was exhausted. <laughs> by the time it got to hour 18, well, the audience was getting a little spiritual. And by the time it got to the 24th hour, they were giddy with everything and all things known to personhood. They didn't know what to do because their bottoms were sore. They didn't know what to do because their hearts were filled. People were just crying without understanding why they were crying. But why? Because then artists showed endurance. An artist displayed freedom. An artist displayed leadership. I can, I must, I will. 
for me, I'm not saying artists for prime minister. But what I am saying is that we are the fourth estate. What I am saying is that if we do not take our responsibility to sit right at the front and in the center of public policy, from health to the environment, from mental health to physical health, if we as artists do not take our place, our rightful place in that, we are not fulfilling our potential. We are not following or even acknowledging why we have been given the blessings of being artists. Because it is no longer about the audience's applause. It is about how we can serve. So before I jump to questions, if there are any, I want to say to all of the artists in the room, that you are God's Christmas present to herself. And I know that there are moments in when it feels like society is treating you like you're the devil's spawn. But you are society's blessings. And every rejection, I'm told, is God's protection. Our job is to make sure we know why we were given the gifts that we were given. Act responsibly, as free as ego as you possibly can. But ultimately, see yourself through the lens of service. That, I hope, explains my dramaturgy of leadership. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for that amazing uh, presentation. Um, without any notes, making all of us lecturers feel uh, quite envious. Uh, that was wonderful. We're just going to take some uh, questions for 15 to 20 minutes or so. Uh, I might just start off, uh, if I may. I should say my name is uh, Fintan Wallen, and I'm a professor of theatre here at Birkbeck. Um, I'd just like to go back to the point in your presentation where you talked about the line between pursuing your vision and also trying to listen to what audiences want. Because it seems to me in all sorts of spheres of leadership, that's the bit that often breaks down. Hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about how you, or you have managed that in the past? Yes, I mean, and, and again, I don't know that I've managed it magnificently well all of the time. But one of the things that I learned, as I said at that moment, when I realized that we had become really successful in PR terms and lost, um, is that how was I listening became the biggest question. And so for me, just in really practical terms, we had an intern class. And so I would send my interns into the toilets and the doors and to listen to every single audience so that I could hear at the end of every night, certainly through previews, what was working, what wasn't working, the things that people wouldn't say. And I have a, I, I, I have a, a, a thing for myself that I'd rather hear it in the rehearsal room than read about it in the Times. And so it meant that I had to open myself to hear hard truths, but hear them constantly and hear them from people that I trust. And so, I, the, and also understanding that listening um, is sometimes about speaking. I, I profoundly believe that a lot of, that most of us learn more from speaking than we do sometimes from listening. Particularly if it's a one-on-one, -on -one. if I'm looking at this, this friend here, and already before just doing that, there is a cellular reaction that you done, you smiled, your eyes went up, your glasses went up slightly. I hadn't even got to the point yet, but already, and you're laughing now, already there was a cellular reaction that told me that actually speaking with you is quite a nice thing, I hope. 
Um, and so actually, I then went out on a speaking tour where I would speak and I would speak about my philosophies and I'd say, this is what I want to do and you tell me if I'm right. So in a way, the quality of listening, making sure listening is right at the core and then adjusting your ego to say, I'm here to serve you. I'm not here to show off. That, that was my, that was, that was my, my, my through line or my, my way through it. But I would say, sorry, I'll take final thing to that. But there are moments when as a leader, your job is to see around the corner. And other people will say, no, you shouldn't. And other people will say, no, we don't want it. And I mean, and then you, you have to have that thing in your stomach that says, I've listened well enough, but I still know that if I turn that corner, when we turn that corner, um, this is the right project for there and then. And I have succeeded more than I have failed in listening and then following my gut. Has your role as a leader, has it changed the way you think about yourself as an artist? Yeah, it has. It's a great question. Um, I was, we, had, we did this 30 million capital campaign at Baltimore, renovated the theater, put in two new theaters. The theater was in my image. I mean, literally there were quotes on the wall. It was all my favorite artists. It was everything that I'd been talking about for seven years saying, I'm going to do this for Baltimore. And I'm going to do that. And I, and the night I was in London and Rada because I was doing a production of my very first play called A Bitter Herb. And um, as a writer, I'm the kind of guy that I write a play and then I forget about it. I don't, I don't know what the plot is. I don't know what, and it's just like I just eject it out of my brain, it's just gone. So I was really nervous about going to see this play. I was like, oh, I'm going to see my younger self. I thought I was really good. And I'm going to see all of the flaws. And I'm going to, and I was just like, oh, and I was really dreading it. And I sat and I watched that play. And I realized that the Kwame that wrote that first play was much braver than I was on that day that leadership had compromised me. The very thing that I had said, which is meet the audience where they are. Well, that is as a curator. But as an artist, your job is not to meet the audience where they are. As a creator, your job is to blaze fire. Yours is to just go out and do and, and, and challenge. And you leave all the other pragmatic things to everybody else in management, but you as the artist, fire. And I, I realized that I had replaced um, the word compromise with pragmatism. And pragmatism was leading my personal art. And so I went home to Baltimore and I resigned the next morning. And I went, I know that if I stay, I'm just gonna be comfortable and I'll never find the fire again. And I didn't know wages, I didn't, I didn't, know, money, I didn't know what was gonna happen. And everybody's like, why you've just built this in your image? And I was just like, no. I have to do this for the artist in me. And so it's a really good question because I describe myself as a generative, interpretive and curatorial artist and each hand washes the other, but each one must be strong of itself or I diminish. I now separate my leadership, just my curation from my generation. Thank you. I'm sure we have lots of questions and we do have a mic um, moving around. So I'm not sure where the mic will be. We might move some questions that were behind here. Yeah. There is a question. Exactly. There's a question. Do you have the mic there? Thank you. I think there's one, two, three, as I see. Thank you. <laughs> uh, hi, Kwame. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah, it is. Thank you very much for that beautiful and inspiring talk and unfortunately very frustratingly you completely anticipated my question and answered it about meeting the audience halfway no it's brilliant of you and i'm very glad you have um, but i mean that was i was really de delighted that you said that because do you think there may be a slight danger now not at Birkbeck, and not you and not the warwick arts i'm not I'm preaching for the converted but in some arts funding and some areas 
that really challenging original drama that says perhaps the royal family is wrong, perhaps church was wrong about some things, could never be produced. Uh, the Breaking of Bun, though, the book by Andrew Sinclair and his film that had a scene where the Queen's waxwork was destroyed had a very bad reception, but it was 1970, it got a certificate, it, it would never be shown now. And he said this book, he died very recently, and are you a little worried, despite having an OBE, that, that there is a sort of stifling <laughs> of originality in the arts a little bit now, and people, there's a drive to conform. I would say two things. That I hope that, that whatever honour I have certainly doesn't compromise the art or the opinions that I have on anything. Um, I would say that I'm both elated, inspired and frightened by where we find art here now. Um, I work between uh, the United States and here quite often. And I think what I do see is with every contraction or financial contraction, um, we as a species revert to a kind of conservatism that makes us sit in fear. And fear is the enemy of the artist. If there is something that I am afraid of as an artist, I must run towards. Otherwise it will contain me. And so I think there is, there is a way in which with the contraction of, of Arts Council funding, and actually they've been very good to us, so thank you very much. Um, but, and, and, and or even of standstill funding from the government, is that there is a huge pressure on institutions to create the event that means you can securely look after your income. Um, and on those who are the least adventurous, that will result in quite boring programming. For those who are the most adventurous, it will bring something out in them that will create stunning original work that by its very nature will, will feed the canon for years to come. So I think two trains can run at the same time. We must always be saying, fight the conservatism in us, no matter what the economic environment is, while pushing to make sure those who have those stunningly original ideas that they find themselves in a position to be able to produce them. Two trains run. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much. Um, all of us here are theatre directing MFAs, so first of all, thank you from all of us. Big up, big up, yeah, big up. You. Um, but I'll, I'll speak for myself. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, um, as a fellow African, how we, and the young, the, the young creators, how, how do you feel or how excited, what the emotions you have for the, the up and coming directors from the diaspora, from Africa. Um, you were talking about courage. Naturally, Africans, we're very courage, courageous people. We'll do it, um, what we need to do, and what was passionate to us. But thinking back to your stories, uh, um, it's not about us and it's not about what feeds us. So, what is your feeling towards the up and coming people talking about Tristan Flynn and talking about? Uh, Ryan Cameron and um, all the other directors uh, and makers. Coming. Yeah, I, I think it's a brilliant question, and thank you for asking that. Um, I, I'm. Let, let me answer this as honestly as I can. I'm wildly excited, and sometimes a little envious. Um, I'm wildly excited because actually, what's coming out of the Black diaspora, and I mean that from the United States to Brazil to the UK, is a is a transformation of form. Um, like, like people are not just writing that straight play or directing just that straight play. People are going, how do I mess with that form? I'd have used a stronger word if it wasn't live streaming. But, um, you know, like, and, and that formal innovation, a little bit like that gentleman's question, is thrilling for theatre. It's leading the way. And I'm seeing it not just in theatre, but I'm seeing it in film. And I'm seeing the way that, that theatre directors are seeing that the world is their oyster, everything in it. And that thrills me. Um, I, I mean, sometimes I'm a little envious, but, but the generation before me must have been envious of mine because we stand on the shoulders, right? 
And even though I, I became the artistic director, and at the time, it was very interesting. At least I think it was interesting. And I say this not as a boast. But there was a moment in time when I got the artistic directorship of the Young Vic, and I was just about to leave Baltimore, where I was the only black artistic director of a major theater in the United States and Europe. That tells you the scale of the sin. That tells you the scale of how untrusted we were to lead institutions of the high arts. It's better now. But I would say, honestly, theater disinvites black males. The work that it produces, as I'm a father, being a father is everything to me. 99% of the narratives about black men are that they are bad fathers, they are bad husbands, they are bad partners. If I go to the theater every time and I see that about myself, how does that make me feel when you know that I feel that theater is about reflection? It is about making me get to the best point that I can be. But every play has the black, that has a black central character, has the black male as the criminal, has the black male as the thing that you have to supersede. And I hate it. And so in a kind of way, what I'm, what I get slightly envious about is that your generation is now in a position to just do the work. And my generation had to do the work and do the advocacy. But you are equipped to do that advocacy. Formally, intellectually, and spiritually. Why? Because you have been placed in a corner where your brilliance has to come out or you die. You are standing on the shoulders of those. And I frame all of that to say that which is not articulated does not exist. I'm articulating that your generation is standing on the shoulders as I was standing on the shoulders of all of those who could have been artistic directors of major theaters. But the time did not allow them. I'm elated for you. I think there was another, there, there in there. And, the, and there, thank you. Sorry to keep poking my... <laughs> So easy. Um, Kami, I'm interested to know from what age, if you can remember, from what age did you have the confidence and determination to achieve what you have achieved? And did anybody influence you apart from your mum? Um, that's really hard when you say apart from my mum. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Yorubas have a wonderful, wonderful um, philosophy. They say that if you were good in your last life, you get to choose the vessel by which you come into this life through. I must have been brilliant in my last <laughs> life to come through my mother. Because my mother filled me with so much love. And that love translated or transposed into a confidence and I don't mean a cockiness, but I mean a confidence that if you could believe in me in the way that you have, I must have something. And you know, my eldest son won a BAFTA a couple of weeks ago. And um, he was a composer and, uh, for a BBC series. And you know what a beautiful thing is? He said to me the other day, he said, Dad, you always believed. And it nearly made me cry because I knew that my mom always believed in me. And then I was able to transfer that to him. So that's a long way round of saying that as long as I've known myself, I've known that I was loved. As long as I've known that I was loved, I wanted to fulfill my potential. And it changes every day. Every day I, I wake and I ask myself, how am I doing the art? Is this the place I should be right now? What is the other place that might be calling me? Technically, about seven is when I wanted to be Michael Jackson. <laughs> okay. I think there's a question there. Thank you so much for the beautiful speech. I was wondering, you spoke about when you looked at the music, and then said that was it. 
was there ever a way that when you played that was coming to the theatrical that was you went to do that moment artist fear of I didn't write today because I had to do the laundry to take kids to school, I don't want it enough, I'm not hungry enough. It's something I really struggle with and I hear a lot of my artist friends talk about struggling with. Did you ever have that moment but then but then did go on? I love that question. I, I love that question. Um, and if it is you or anyone that you know, I send love to your heart for those moments. Those moments of profound doubt. Those moments when you are negotiating with whether this will pass me by or whether I have, I really do have the thing that it, that I need to do to be that being. I often say to young actors, I tell this story. An actor friend of mine, he, uh, his father was an actor. And he said, Dad, what advice would you give me? And he said, there are a thousand reasons, son, why you might not get a job. Just don't let your acting be one of them. <laughs> And I love that story because ultimately there are a million times when you don't have the strength. I wake up now at 3 a.m. in the morning in order to complete a deadline and then I'm in rehearsals at 8. Having, we all need it. We all need someone to say, I like what you did. We all need someone to say, let me produce what you did. We all need that moment when the kids don't wake up at 8 and I can just do that right here for two hours. <laughs> But ultimately, you must believe until you can't believe anymore. And when I got to that point in music, it is that I had run after the bus as hard as I could and I just couldn't get on the bus. I just kept missing or the bus kept leaving without me. And I knew that I didn't have it in me anymore because I had run so hard. So as a playwright and as a writer, yeah, there have been times when I've gone, um, I don't know that I got it. I don't know that they want what I got. And then I go back to that moment is, am I at that moment when I know that it's, I cannot, and if I do, I will damage myself? No. So that's my moment. Does that answer that? Sending love. I think there's a question there and there's a question there. Thank you. Um, a two-part question, if that's all right. Um, yeah. As a black man, looking mm. back on your journey, what would you say have been your greatest challenges and how did you overcome them? One. <laughs> and the second part is, looking back on that journey now, what do you want your legacy to be? Good. Um, Thank you. I would always describe, um, when people say to me, have you ever experienced racism as an actor in the arts, as a director? As I would always respond by, I don't know that I have very much over in an overt fashion. I describe systemic oppression as me not even knowing the rooms that I should walk into. And so it's less for me about what was really hard and more about what rooms did they not let me in? And now that I know those rooms, what strategy will I use to get into those rooms? And then create my own rooms. I have this thing much like my plays that I kind of forget the hard times. I kind of throw it out. I'm not calling that healthy, but I kind of do because there have been times when I, I have found it hard to raise my head. I found it, the first time I became an artistic director, I, I, I was in over my head and I found myself just coming home and screaming at my wife about all the things that were happening to me and my best friend, I would just be screaming, ah! I can literally, my memory of the first two years is a big, ah! 
and then something cracks. And once it cracks, I want to go the screaming, I'm going to let that go. And I'm going to concentrate on the cracks. Or excavating those cracks. So when I look back, I look back with gratitude that I have been given the facility to attempt to supersede my circumstance. And legacy, I'm in the legacy business. Right now, my curatorial space is all about legacy. Not personal legacy, but the legacy of saying, who did I put on the stage? Who did I give a break? Who did I open up? What space, what room did I invite someone into that hitherto they were not allowed in? Now, that's, that's not Kwame legacy, to speak about myself in the third person. Um, that is just, I'm at that grand age where it's less about what goes on my CV and more about what I can help put on someone else's, like the young brother there. Thank you. There's a question there, I see. Um, hello, my name is Kadiatu Dunye. Um, I think I've seen you over the last three decades and it's amazing to watch your trajectory. Um, and also, you know, the stories of the love that you received despite all the cracks, the downfall, you know, the doors that others might not have opened, but the love that you received from your mother and the weight, you know, the power that it gives you to have the confidence. So my question is this, um, for those of us who didn't even have a mother or that, that sort of, uh, sure person or people cohort and we're striving what words of encouragement do you give us um, in terms of marching forward and delivering and kicking down doors and getting in there um, that's a beautiful question and and I thank you for for me being able to acknowledge my privilege and um, because it is a privilege um, my mother was an orphan, and yet she opened her home to maybe 300 children because she understood that love was the superpower and that young people need that superpower on a daily basis. And so I don't have the answers to say what is the fuel that you can use, except for there is the God that is in you, that has given you what they have given you. And ultimately, sometimes it is given to us and sometimes we have to self-generate. And whatever you need to do legally to self-generate, <laughs> um, seek it and find it. Because I was fortunate to have that jet fuel and I don't know if I didn't have that jet fuel, if I'd have been able to walk the streets that I have walked, but I was fortunate. Find the God in you. There's one there and there's one there. Thank you. Thank you. My name is, is Dativa Moshi. It's true, uh, Kwame, you are being blessed because I heard about you since I was in Tanzania. So it's a privilege to meet you today. So my question is, it's true you say trust in God. It, you know, everything will be added to you. My question today, so what are you going to advise, you know, like young people to be confident in how they can go about to get uh, experience through your field? Because one of my, my daughters, she's, she's want to be toward the U.S. So currently she's at um, Northampton University, do media and all the things. So what the message I can pass to her to, tonight? Well, congrats, mom, first thank of all. Thank you. And, uh, and, and secondly, uh, thank you for your kind words. And I'm going to go back to the thing that I said a bit earlier on and then try and augment. There are a thousand reasons why you might not get a job. Just don't let your acting, your writing, your ex- be the reason why, be one of them. And what I would say to you, young daughter, is to identify 
the areas. In my generation, it was area. But the areas that are of profound interest to her spirit and her soul. We do this not because we want to, but because we must. Identify the must. And then, I, then find the people who see the world in the way that you see it, who are running organizations or companies, and write to them, email them, harangue them with your truth. Because sometimes, you know, like all of us, we get X amount of emails a day. And sometimes an email comes to and it's framed in exactly the way that makes me go, okay, I'm not going to answer that in three days. I'm going to answer it now. Why? Because you spoke my truth to me. You spoke my language. Find out the language of the person you are writing to and with sincerity, write your truth to them. Contact them with your truth. Then there's the mechanical, right? If she's a playwright, then send all your plays to her, to all of the theaters that accept plays. If she's a director, it's like make your short film every weekend, you know, make a movie, you know, write every night, make a movie on a Saturday, edit it on a Sunday, speak to your homie who's a musician and put, put the music on it on a Monday and then show it to your friends and get their criticism and get that back. And by the next week, get back on the saddle. If you're a singer, what is your genre? What is a genre of tomorrow? How are you going to continue to innovate, innovate in the space? Whatever brand of art that she is doing or wants to go into, innovation, access, and determination. Is that my guy there? Just behind you? He was... Yeah. Who is he? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, you've just directed your first film, which I think you said you're editing at the moment. I'm just wondering the different challenges in directing a film and theatre, and especially with a film, there's like a lot of people higher up with money, so I don't know how much of a pressure that was. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm still in the edit, as I, as I said. I'm in post-production right now. And, uh, and yeah, there's a hierarchy. I'm the boss, right, when I'm, when I'm directing at my theatre. Um, actually, but I, I'm never comfortable being the boss. I, I often work in other people's theatres because I enjoy, um, I, I enjoy learning and, and learning how, what works in their house, how they run their organisations and what their aesthetic is. Um, I would always say when I was directing for theatre, there were two things that sit for me. Theatre is a non-literal space. Hang up your literal boots when you come in the door. Film is a literal space. If I say I'm in Paris and I'm in a theatre, black box, you put the Eiffel Tower in the back. If I say I'm in Paris in a conversation in the movie, you better see the Eiffel Tower or the Louvre. And so actually it, it was for me trying to make sure that I understood those two things, that, that abstract form in film um, is, a, is a discipline that I have not yet mastered. So I have to understand how to master the literal and the storytelling. And very quickly, I would say that I've learned also that in the movie, you, you, know, you make a film three times. You write it, you shoot it, and then you edit it. And when you edit it, you are creating a different story. You are, your sequences are different, and ADR is your king. As to how I handle hierarchy, I'm, I'll find out. I'm a, I just handed in <laughs> my, my, um, my first director's cut, and we did a that's a screening, a public screening, um, or preview in New York two weeks ago. Really painful sitting with 200 people, don't know you're in the room, about to rip your film apart and loving it. But actually it went well. And, um, and, and I'm learning, I'm really enjoying learning something from, from the beginning and really nervous of as I hand it in and it no longer, I don't have final cut. And so uh, I have to negotiate um, I, what I have to hand in on my second draft has to be the thing I'm willing to stand by. Um, tell the story in the best possible way is my, is my motto. So I've been learning a lot. I've been learning a lot. It's been really humbling. And so the final thing that I'll say is that we shot the movie and it was like brilliant. We were all really wildly excited about it. And people go, oh, it's the best film I've worked on for 20 years. The atmosphere is brilliant. And we were just like, yeah, we've done it. And it's great. And it's great. And I got into the car and I went, I hate this. <laughs> and I hated it for eight weeks while we was in it. It's great. And learning to live with 
your art that you hate. That's, that's, that, 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 that's, been a, that's been a steep learning curve. I don't hate it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Next question. Hi, my name is Ramat Tijani. Um, I used to watch Casualty way back when. So when I came in today and the, the guys at reception were like, oh, how do you even know this guy? I was like, I watched him on Casualty. He was the one black face that I saw on a Saturday evening and that my parents were like, yeah, you can watch that show. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess like I, like many people in this room have kind of like watched your journey and it's like amazing to see. And I guess my question was around whether or not there are any lessons that you learned from way back then that you still carry with you today. Um, so yeah. What a brilliant question. And thank you, mommy and daddy for letting you watch. I know, right? <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Um, uh, well, I'm going to make it quick. Um, so my job as an actor when I landed in Castro, I was in it for five years. And initially, I was only meant to be in one episode. And I did the first episode. And I went, oh, we really like you. Do you want to stay for three? I went, yeah, great. And, uh, and then I got to near the end of the third one. And I went, do you want to stay for a year? I went, oh, yeah, why not? That's solid money for a year. That's good. Um, and, uh, and then I realized, oh, excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. <coughs> Bless me. Thank you. Um, and then I realized that actually at the end of year one, there was a huge cull of all of the people that I came in with. I was like, yo, I, 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 I want to stay here for a bit. And so I realized that what I had to do was look upwards, not sideways. I had to not look at my peers and what they were doing and what they were doing in the scenes and what they I need to understand what the producers were doing, what the produce, what the arc of the characters that they were writing. So what I used to do is, um, illegally, is that I would steal the keys and I'd go into the script box <laughs> and I would look at what's happening like at the eight, eight, eight episodes ahead, 12 episodes ahead. And I, and, and I, would, I would skip and I'd go, oh, okay, okay. And what I would do, uh, and, and this is really important, because you, you were right, I was one of the few black men on TV uh, at the time, and, and Casualty had a kind of one black man in, one black out, kind of. <laughs> and, um, and I remember really clearly when there was another black brother came in, I, was in, I would even remember where I was, I was on a hill, um, and, and the producer went, we're, we're gonna get a black doctor, and I went, yeah! Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. Phone bank, do I have enough to pay tax? Um, and, uh, and so one day, um, I, 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 I was really mindful and I was really purposeful. I went, what do I want this character to be? Okay, first of all, I want the black audience, because I knew they did tests. I want the black audience to say, oh, I quite like that guy. And so I made sure that, that I didn't sound too posh and that I kind of made sure that my, that, you know, that it was... And then I wanted the white audience to go, oh, I quite like that guy. And so I, I do it naturally anyway, but I would make sure that the character was warm. And so that would get me through the tests, as it were. They'd say, yeah, you should keep him on. But the way to do that for me was to avoid race. It's prime time television. Don't do race. And so one day, and I will get to the, I will land the plane in a moment. One day I went into the drawer and I saw race riot in Hobi. I went, no, no, they're going to bring me in it. I know they're going to bring me in. And a group of, of, of black boys had kind of hijacked Josh. Josh was the white paramedic. And I was just like, no, that means they're going to bring me in. He's, I'm his partner. And in comes Finn. That was my character name. In comes Finn. And Finn says to the guys, listen. And they, yeah, they go, what are you doing here? And I go, listen, let him go. And they go, why? You coconut. And I, went, and I went, and it was written. When I've got this uniform on, I'm not black. I'm not pink. I'm green. I was like, I'm going to get run in the street. <laughs> My credibility gone. Scores gone. People are going to, the green man. I'm like, when I'm walking down, I was just like, I'm done. And so I went, what am I going to, how do I do this? 
Because to even say that it's going to happen, I would have to reveal that. I go into the drawers <laughs> and read the scripts. So I, I went up to the, the, the next person on the script editor and I said, I heard <laughs> that, that, that there's going to be like a, a kind of race riot scene and Finn's going to come in. And the producer went, yeah, yeah, isn't it great? I went, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I, can I, can I read it? And I went, no, 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 no. I went, oh, it'd be really good. And eventually I got to read it ahead. And I went, I don't think I, I should say the green thing. And the producer went, well, no, you will. Because it's my statement. It's what I want to say to the world. I went, with the greatest respect, I'm like black, and I'm just letting you know, we don't really use language like that. This guy went, I don't care, that's what I want. And it was a critical moment. And I went, okay, cool. So I went to their boss. I said, just want to let you know, this green thing, I really don't want to do it for all of the reasons that I've just explained. And the boss said, I can't undermine that producer. So I went, okay. So I went to their boss. And I went, don't want to do the green thing <laughs> for all the reasons. And they went, you're going to have to do it. And I went, okay. So I went to their boss. <laughs> and uh, there's no more bosses after that. <laughs> and I said, green thing, don't want to do it. Got on the phone. They said, I can't undermine the hierarchy. You're going to have to do it. So I got onto set, knowing it was the end of my, <laughs> my authenticity badge was about to be pulled from me. And, uh, and all of the hierarchy were there to watch me. And I went on and I did, and I did it. And I did it the best way that I could. And then just as I said, thank you, Sir Rapman, I went, could I just do one more take? And I wonder if I could just give you one offering. And they went, and they looked at each other, having thought, ooh. And so I did the line without the green, where I must have said just something like, listen, this is my friend and we work together. And I just, he's a good guy. Did it, silence. Thank you, Kwan. One take, done. Then I sat waiting for like two weeks, waiting for the episode to come out. No one spoke to me. I couldn't get into the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> Everything locked. Couldn't get into the edit. Locked. I was like, yo. The episode came out and they used the one take. Yes. The one without the green. Yes. The lesson I learned from that, I don't say it to hero as a hero. I don't even say it for applause. I say it to answer your question. The one thing that I learned was do your work, do your homework, do the best that you can do and offer a damn good alternative. That's the lesson that I keep throughout the rest of my artistic life. Thank you. It falls on me to tell you that two people in June have the unenviable task of trying to follow this up with two further uh, lectures. Uh, you can find information about those on this sheet and I believe you'll be on a mailing list as well. Uh, following uh, this, we're going to meet outside for a reception. You're all welcome to join. Uh, and finally, I just want to thank Kwame for a, an incredible lecture. Uh, so many riches that you've given us, so many blessings that I know will make a huge difference to the way we think about art and also cultural leadership. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I just want to, there's a woman here, Deirdre, that, that like literally supports black art and black theater and black playwrights for the last 30 years. And while I'm here, it'd be remiss of me not to big you up. Thank you for the support.